Hear the word of the Lord. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Good morning and welcome to St Andrew's Cathedral, Sydney, Australia, for this online service of the word as we gather together to praise God, to hear his holy word read and to be encouraged to pray to God. My name is Chris Allen and I'm one of the ministers here and this morning we continue our series looking at the prophet Isaiah being encouraged to hear of God's grace and his mercy. We begin our time this morning by praising God in song. Praise the God of our salvation, heaven and earth and all creation. Praise and glorify his name. Last week, we were reminded of the holiness and the majesty of God. In chapter 6, we read, Above God were seraphim, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. We continue to praise God in prayer by joining together and praying. Gracious God, we humbly thank you for all your gifts so freely given to us, for life and health and safety, for power to work, leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your Spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we open God's word at the reading for today, Isaiah chapter 9. And before we do that, let me pray. Thank you, Father, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Open our hearts to receive your word that we may know you better and be thoroughly equipped for every good work through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. The first lesson is from Isaiah chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join together to read Psalm 8. Let us say these words together. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now, and forever. Amen. The second Bible reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 12 to 25. Matthew 4, verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness, have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. 
From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralysed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is tradition for Christians to stand as they declare their common belief in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And you might like to do that in your own homes now. Let us affirm with Christians across the ages what we believe about God and his love for us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, friends, I wonder if you would turn to the first of our readings from Isaiah chapter 9. That is where we'll be spending most of our time uh, this day. And let me lead us in prayer as we prepare. May the words of my lips and may the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I've called today's sermon, Hope in Hopeless Times. For that, I believe, is the gift that God wants to give to us from this chapter of Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 9. For as was the case for the people of God in the 8th century BC, the time of Isaiah, uh, we too, like them, are living in profoundly troubling times. Times that have no evident endpoint, times that lack a clear sense of internal resolution, times that in many ways seem to be going from bad to worse. Whether it's the spread of fresh waves of new COVID variants, or the recent fires in Greece, the earthquake in Haiti, the catastrophe that is Afghanistan, or just the more nebulous threat of a warming planet, well, frankly, there is no shortage of reasons for people to be troubled. And of course, as Christians, if you add to that the slow but steady dissolution of Western civilization, uh, a death, as many have pointed out, that is virtually inevitable now that the Christian roots of our culture have been effectively severed, well, then, humanly speaking, it is more than appropriate to call these times hopeless times, times without hope. The novelist and essayist Paul Kingsnorth recently put it this way. 
He wrote, when an old culture built around a sacred order dies, there will be lasting upheaval at every level of society, from the level of politics to the level of the soul. The shape of everything, family, work, moral attitudes, the very existence of morals at all, notions of good and evil, sexual mores, perspectives on everything from money to rest to work to nature to the body to kin to duty, all of it will be up for grabs. He concludes, welcome to 2021. Now, friends, the hopelessness of the times, however, does not mean hopelessness for God's people. And there's a very simple reason for that. And the reason is this. Our hope is not in the times. No, no, our hope is in God. It mustn't be in the times, but it must only be in God, in his character, in his purposes, in his promises, in his power. And that is the drum that Isaiah the prophet has been beating right throughout chapter 7 and 8 of his prophecy. It's why, for example, in chapter 8 verses 12 and 13, he offers this exhortation to the people of his day. He says, do not call conspiracy everything this people calls conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. So here is a call for the people of God to have a proper regard, not only for their times, but ultimately for God, to recognize where true power lies, to trust Him, to draw, draw strength, comfort, and confidence from Him, and in particular from His Word. For there really is no alternative for God's people. And that's why at the very end of chapter 8, Isaiah says this. He says, when someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom and they will be thrust into utter darkness. So there's the warning with which chapter 8 concludes. Right? Don't be tempted to avail yourselves of so-called psychic services as they are uh, oddly labeled today. They'll either be deceptive or they'll be devilish, right? either spurious or satanic. But either way, the outcome will be the same, distress, darkness, fearful gloom. Well, that is indeed the state of many hearts today, as it was the state of many in Isaiah's day. And so we come, therefore, to chapter 9, because in chapter 9 we have a promise from God, a promise of what God is going to do for his people, a prophecy designed to give them and us hope in hopeless times. It comes in three parts. The banishment of gloom, the dawning of the light, and the arrival of of the king. So let's look at these three parts together. Firstly, the banishing, banishment of gloom. Verse 1. Nevertheless, begins chapter 9, nevertheless there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, the Lord humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. Now here's this promise of the banishment of gloom and it mentions the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali uh, because they were the first parts of Israel to fall to the Assyrian forces. And that all happened just not long before this prophecy was given. It's why King Ahaz back in chapter 7 was so spooked 
and worried that what happened in the north of the country was going to happen in the south of the country. But the Lord here promises he is in fact going to turn around what took place in the north of the country in the future. He will honor that very region of Israel that was so humiliated in the day of Isaiah and King Ahaz. And friends, here's the incredible thing from our perspective. He's done it. It's happened. It happened long ago, in fact. God has fulfilled his promise to the letter. And so you ask, when did he do that? How did he do that? Well, we actually heard it, didn't we? In our second reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. We read, when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Here is the promise coming true in the days of Jesus, under the ministry of Jesus. Now, those of us who were members of the cathedral family about a decade or more ago will remember that at the end of 2011, we had three travelers from a particular Islamic country who came to our Christmas Day service. They came because they wanted to find out about Jesus. Well, they not only found out about Jesus, they found Jesus. They came to know him. They came to trust him. And it was, in fact, on Easter Sunday of the following year that the three of them were baptized down at Clavelli Beach. Now, understandably, having become Christians, they were not able to safely return to their country of origin, and so they each one applied for protection visas. And this, of course, meant you know, interviews with immigration officials who wanted to make sure that they were genuine converts and not, as it were, rotting the system. Now, I had the great privilege of going with one of these men. Uh, Peter uh, was his new Christian name. I went with him to his interview at the Department of Immigration, and I re remember the interviewer asking him what his favorite book of the Bible was. And he answered very, very uh, immediately, oh, the Gospel of John, he said. I love the Gospel of John. But then the interviewer rather cunningly said, what about the Old Testament? And he said, oh, he said, well, that would be Isaiah, he said. And he got very excited. He said, Isaiah is wonderful. Isaiah is all about Jesus. It was written eight centuries before Jesus, but it's all about Jesus, he said. And the interviewer said, okay, okay, I, I'm, I, I get it, I'm convinced. Uh, settle down. But of course, Peter was exactly right. Isaiah is all about Jesus. His prophecy finds its fulfillment in Jesus, in every way, at every level, but of course, at particular, in particular ways, at particular levels. But Peter was spot on. It is Jesus who brings all of God's promises to fulfillment, all of his purposes to completion. As I said, that is evident in a dozen different places, a dozen different ways throughout the 66 chapters of Isaiah's prophecy, but it jumps out in particular places. And chapter 9, of course, is one of those places, as Matthew's gospel highlights for us. And so it is the arrival of Jesus that marks the fulfillment of this promise of the banishment of gloom. Remember what the angel said to the shepherds when Jesus had been born in Bethlehem? Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Yes, here is the banishment of gloom with the birth of Jesus, the Son of God. And so Isaiah's prophecy then goes on to describe the dawning of the light, because of, that's the flip side, isn't it? Once you banish gloom, banish darkness, well, the light comes flooding in. But as he does so in verses 2 to 5, you'll notice something very interesting. Isaiah, as it were, is sort of cast forward into the future. 
and from the future looks back and then speaks as if these things have already happened when, of course, from his own vantage point in time and history, they had not yet happened. So you have a look at verse 2. He says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, that's an event uh, recorded for us in Judges chapter 8, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Well, here's a wonderful picture of both what you might call the positive and the negative dimensions of the promised deliverance. Right? A picture of both what the Lord is going to save his people from and what the Lord is going to save his people for. Now, on the from side, he's going to deliver them from darkness and oppression. That's why verse 4 speaks there of shattering the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. And then on the four side, the positive side, he will bring them into the light, and as verse 3 says, enlarge their nation and increase their joy. Now all of these themes get elaborated at great length in the New Testament, where it becomes crystal clear that our ultimate enemy is none other than sin itself, for it's sin that puts us under the wrath of God. It's sin that opens us up to the accusations of the devil. It's sin that makes us the playthings and the subjects of death. And that is why the first and fundamental purpose of Jesus' coming is to deal with sin, to save us from our sins, as the angel said to Joseph, to make provision for our forgiveness through the sacrifice of of himself. For sin is our great problem, the problem of problems, and forgiveness likewise, our greatest need. And again, friends, he has done it. This has happened. It has taken place. It has been fulfilled. Jesus has saved us from our sins, delivered us from our oppressors. He's done it through his death and his resurrection. It's why in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul can say this, that God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It is done. Transferred from darkness to light, from death to life from sin to forgiveness. Now, we've run on ahead a little bit, of course, because in order to save us, the Lord must first come to us, and in order to come to us, he must indeed be born as one of us. And so we come thirdly to the third section of this wonderful prophecy and promise, the arrival of the king in verses 6 and 7. These will be familiar words to us, but they are utterly astonishing, so please hear them as if you've never heard them before. For here we read, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, there are three explicit prophecies of the coming Messiah in these early chapters of the book of Isaiah. You get one in chapter 7, one in chapter 9 here, and then another one we'll look at in a week or so in chapter 11. And you no doubt remember the words of chapter 7, verse 14, that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, a word that means God with us. But of course, it begs the question, in what sense is this child going to be God with us? Is the child a symbol of God's presence, or is in fact the child the embodiment of God's presence? Well, the answer here is in chapter 9, verse 6, 
This child to be born is to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Right here are several indications of deity staring us right in the face. I mean, the word wonderful, in fact, carries the sense of supernatural. And the word God, of course, means, you guessed it, God. And the word everlasting, likewise, means what it says. Lasting forever, eternal. And in case we've missed the point, look at verse 7, which expands it and drives it home. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And friends, guess what? He has. It's accomplished. It's done. It's finished. Now, of course, from Isaiah's point in time, it was eight centuries in the future. But from our point in time, it's 21 centuries in the past. Jesus has died for your sins. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Jesus is now reigning as king of the cosmos, enthroned at God's right hand on high. Now, if that is so, it does raise an obvious question, at least in the minds of many. If Jesus is king, if he is now reigning, why the world? Why the world like it is? Why is it still in a mess? Why does rebellion continue? Why does the devil still rage? Why do the forces of chaos persist, sin and death, triumphing seemingly at every turn? What is the answer? Well, the answer, friends, is that Jesus is in the process of implementing his rule in this world. Yes, his kingdom has come, but it is also still to come. For though he has already come to us, he will yet come to us a second time. And when he comes a second time, as we declared in the creed just a few moments ago, he will come to judge the living and the dead. He will conclude the history of this world and turn the kingdoms of this world into his own kingdom. And so for now, we live in between the times. We live in between the commencement of Jesus' reign and the completion of Jesus' reign. But here's the thing. We can be absolutely sure that just as his current reign is a reality, so his final victory is a certainty. I mean, we sing about this often enough, don't we? That wonderful hymn of Charles Wesley's, Rejoice, the Lord is King. You remember the fourth verse? It says, he sits at God's right hand till all his foes submit and bow to his command and fall beneath his feet. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice, again I say, rejoice. And rejoice we should. Rejoice we must. Rejoice as people rejoice at the harvest, says Isaiah, as warriors re rejoice when dividing the plunder. Indeed, we can even rejoice in the midst of trials, even in the depths of suffering, even in the throes of uncertainty, the face of calamity. We can rejoice in such times, not because we pretend they don't exist, ignoring their reality, nor because we deny their pain and the suffering they cause, 
No, we can rejoice in such times because God's Word enables us to see them from an eternal perspective and to understand, as the Apostle Paul puts it, that our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And so we sing, rejoice in glorious hope. Jesus the judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. We soon shall hear the archangel's voice. God's trumpet call shall sound. Rejoice. Now, if you've just tuned in for this sermon today, you might be forgiven for thinking that Christmas has come early, or at least that uh, we're having a bit of a Christmas in August celebration service. You know, for isn't Isaiah 9, the text for such an occasion, isn't it a, a classic Christmas passage, a reading for Christmas Day or Christmas Eve at least? And the answer is, of course it is. That's why it's often read on such occasions. But the point I want us to see is that this indeed is a passage for every day. For every day. For as I said at the beginning, the purpose of this prophecy is to supply God's people with hope. That was its purpose then in the time of Isaiah. It's God's purpose now in our time. For just as the Israelites had held before them the hope of Jesus' first coming, so we have held before us the hope of Jesus' second coming. And here's the thing. Just as certainly as the promise of his first coming has been fulfilled, so the promise of his second coming will be fulfilled. The God who has done the one, accomplished the first, will do the other and accomplish the second. You can be absolutely sure of that, for the zeal of the Lord Almighty, says Isaiah, will accomplish this. He will. Nothing can stay his hand. So let me close by reading you a very, very insightful comment that comes from Alec Matias' commentary on the book of Isaiah. Matthias says, as always, the people of God must decide what reading of their experiences they will live by. Are they to look at the darkness, the hopelessness, the dream shattered, and conclude that God has forgotten them? Or are they to recall his past mercies, to remember his present promises, and to make great affirmations of faith? Isaiah insists that hope is a present reality, part of the constitution of the now. The darkness is true, but it is not the whole truth, and certainly not the fundamental truth. Mattia is exactly right. The darkness is true, It's around us, it's real, it's painful. But it is not the whole truth and it is not the fundamental truth because the fundamental truth is that King Jesus reigns as Lord of life, master of death. And if we know this truth, if we believe this truth, then no matter how seemingly hopeless the times may be or become, We do not lose heart. We do not give way to fear. We trust in the Lord. We wait for him. And we rejoice as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. 
Amen. God's word says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Although we are the people of God, Scripture reminds us that we still sin. 
we need to confess our failures, knowing that the Lord Jesus died for us and intercedes for us with the Father. Let us draw near to God, who freely forgives through his infinite goodness and mercy and pray to him with sincerity and confidence. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you and serve you as we should. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace, that we may continue to grow as members of Christ, in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and turn to his Son, Jesus Christ, in whom alone there is no condemnation. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Merciful God, it is by your gift alone that your faithful people offer you true and acceptable service. Grant that we may so faithfully serve you in this life that we fail not finally to obtain your heavenly promises. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Continue in prayer, and I'll be praying for two things this morning. We're praying for our Christian brothers and sisters in Afghanistan and our frontline workers. Let us pray. Sovereign God, we worship you and we acknowledge that you know all of those who suffer in your name. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would make us ever mindful of our brothers and sisters around the world who need us to stand with them as they suffer in your name. Today, we lift up those suffering for the gospel in Afghanistan. May they know you this day. May they know your presence and your comfort. We remember those today who are being imprisoned for their faith and ask that they would join with the Apostle Paul to see that even though they remain captive, their chains have furthered the gospel, not frustrated it. May they inspire and embolden their fellow believers to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. God of all comfort for those who are tortured, both in body and mind. Give them the grace to endure and to see their suffering as part of following in Christ's footsteps. Merciful God, for those asked to pay the ultimate price, who are martyred because of their love for you, may they truly know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death. Father God, for those who are widowed and orphaned, may they know the comfort that comes from your promise, even when they walk through the valley. May they be strengthened by your spirit, enabling them to rejoice with the psalmist as they proclaim that the Lord will not abandon them in death. Lord of all mercy, protect the vulnerable in Afghanistan this day. Provide and protect the young women, the children, those who are aged, mothers, the disabled. Lord, let these ones know this day that they are loved by you, that they are not forgotten. Through your Holy Spirit, provide peace and consolation, assurance and trust. We commit these, these dear ones to you. And Lord, just as you miraculously turn Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor of your people, to become one of your servants. 
We ask this day that you would do your work again in bringing those who are lost, those who are violent, those who have darkened hearts to a place of repentance and sorrow, that they would cast themselves upon your mercy and hear of your forgiveness found in the Lord Jesus. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, during our period of lockdown, we particularly commit to you today our frontline workers. We thank you this day for those working in the health sector, caring for the sick, for nurses, for doctors, those working in the emergency rooms, for hospital chaplains, for social workers, physios, GPs. We thank you, Lord, for these servants. We thank you for those working to protect our society, for our servicemen and servicewomen, our police, our firefighters, our emergency service workers. We thank you today for those who teach our children, for those who care for the aged, for those ministering to the homeless, those working in essential services. We thank you for cleaners and those extending themselves to provide us with essential things. We thank you for and commit to you these frontline workers. We ask for these servants of yours that you would protect them from illness and despair, strengthen and equip them for their tasks as they aid and support our communities, enable them to fulfill with integrity and in faithful service to others, living and working in harmony and safety, using the fruits of their toil for the good of all, for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Before we end this time, I want to remind you that immediately following this streaming of this service, you have the opportunity meet, to meet with us on the Zoom platform for a bit of a chat. Uh, there will be opportunity for prayer and to ask any questions that you might have. Uh, the staff are all, are, are all on that Zoom uh, platform and we do hope that you might join with us, uh, particularly if you haven't been with us uh, yet. Why don't you make today the time you join with us? The details for that will be on our webpage right now, sydneycathedral.com, www.sydneycathedral.com. And also there uh, is information about all of the different things happening at the cathedral, including how you might contact us. And I also want to remind you that that QR code that's been up in the corner of um, the page uh, on the screen, you can see it there right now, that is a way in which you can contact us and particularly uh, send us some prayer points uh, asking us to pray in a particular way and it will be our privilege and uh, a real joy to be able to do that with you. And friends, now let us join together and pray this prayer of dedication together. Father, take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.